I want to dive in today to on-chain securitizations. Uh, you know, going into this, we were thinking a little bit about the uh, Daft, Pex, Daft Punk song, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. Um, but three guys I know very well, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get into it. But um, there's the way I think about this this journey, and it is a it is a journey <laughs> that we're on. Um, is that you know, MakerDAO has kind of been the focal point. Uh, and even going back to the last panel when they talked about like a central hub of liquidity, I was going to make the joke that I've always seen MakerDAO as that central hub of liquidity. I think a lot of people have over time, um, or at least a source of capital on chain. Um, I think we've got some interesting perspectives from Kirill at New Silver, talking kind of from the asset origination seat, um, who's been using Centrifuge for three years. Um, and then, of course, uh, Kevin Chan here uh, from Block Tower, um, who can really start to speak to um, where they kind of see securitizations um, on Centrifuge and how their relationship with MakerDAO. Um, but I think it's going to be really exciting. So, guys, just take one minute just to introduce yourselves, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, sure. Uh, Sebastian, chef at uh, Steakhouse Financial. Uh, so we are a company that helps uh, to build open and transparent finance. Uh, we are working with uh, MakerDAO, ENS, Lidos, all the good stuff. And we do financial reporting so everyone can understand what is happening on the blockchain. And we also uh, worked on real world asset quite a lot, and um, especially with those two people, but some other in the room, to bridge the gap between DeFi and TradFi so that we can invest from DeFi to TradFi. I'm Kirill Bensonov, CEO of New Silver. We're the TradFi of that equation. Um, I guess we're, we're a construction lender, a real-world construction lender, a fix-and-flip lender. Um, I believe we were Maker's first RWA partner uh, some years ago. And I've been working with Centrifuge for three years, right? Three years. Yeah. And uh, hey everyone, Kevin from Block Tower. Uh, we're an investor in the real-world assets and tokenized asset space, um, and that's across the stack. We operate two pools on Centrifuge, work closely with Maker, and uh, are just generally invested in uh, bringing additional standards and rigor and uh, optimizations to tokenized assets and real-world assets. So really excited for this panel. All right. Uh, Seb, let's go back to you, right? So one of the takeaways from the morning is that uh, stable coins were the first real-world asset. Um, and maybe the the killer app or the killer use case. Um, you've been at Maker a while. Talk us through from a securitization perspective, right? Um, everything that's come across your desk, everything that you've seen, maybe even the work that you're doing now at Steakhouse Financial. Um, maybe take us on the journey of of how things have changed or how things, you know, hopefully have changed over the last three years. Um, as you think about kind of the securitizations and all the bells and whistles that go around a securitization. Yeah, sure. Uh, my pleasure. So, securitization, we can have a technical debate, but let's, very simple. You take a lot of stuff and you put them in a bag and you have, you create what we call a senior, something safe, fur, and a junior piece. And so the junior will take the fluctuation of the, of the bag of assets before the senior gets uh, any problem. And if you look at stablecoin like DAI, that's what we kind of, uh, that's what uh, MakerDAO is doing because they are investing in a lot of stuff, mainly crypto back loans, but also now a lot of real world assets. And for instance, it's those two companies. Uh, but there is always some uh, junior capital, which is uh, the surplus, what they call the surplus buffer, which protects the DAI holders to be sure that DAI is always $1. Even if uh, Kirill is making a bad investment once, then he never did actually, I think. Uh, so that's what securitization is at the protocol level. And then underneath, uh, for instance, at New Silver, New Silver is providing either with some junior capital and some senior capital. Uh, and Maker only invests in the senior tranche because we want DAI to be super safe, so we don't want to take uh, much risk, which means we have a lower yield than what you can expect uh, in an edge fund. But the point is not to make the highest uh, profits, it's mainly to keep the DAI uh, safe at the beginning. So it was a very long process. I started to work on it in 2020, but people started even before. And so the, the issue, main issue is a legal one. When you don't exist, how can you transact and sign a contract? Because to, real world assets are in the real world. And so it's quite difficult to say, well, where do I sign and who should sign? Actually, we don't exist. So that was a lot of uh, complication. It took a few years 
to get to the right solution. And it's very interesting because uh, New Silver was the first one uh, taking dye from MakerDAO. And now there is a New Silver V2, more or less, same pool, but that evolved with a way better structuring of the legal side. And we can go into details later, but uh, yeah, at the beginning it was quite simple. We just invest, we use some other co-investors as a safety that if someone does something that is not good, someone will sue them. And thanks to the smart contract, we know that everyone will get the proper cash flows. Uh, but now we have uh, in-depth trust, uh, there is a lot of corporate services uh, in the mix, I see them uh, in the room. So there is a whole professionalization of real assets and it's really a process because when you start with a pool of 1 million, if you want to have something investment grade with all the cost associated and all the lawyer fees to spend, well, you spend 2 million to make a 1 million investment. So maybe it would have been better to not make uh, any uh, safety. So yeah, it's a process. We are still super early, but we are getting there. So a quick follow on, and anyone can, can answer this looking back at the last three years. What's the impetus, right, for how Maker and Steakhouse and what you all do, what, what, was, the, what was the catalyst for why securitizations have become more institutional, right? Like, what, like what's been motivating that? I think from the start, the idea was to get there, to be an institution. I mean, we want to do DeFi. The whole goal is to do better than what TradFi is doing. But you cannot start at doing better uh, the first day. So it was really a process. And securitization, if you remember three years ago, no, two years ago, one year? I don't remember. There was a beer market somewhere. Uh, we, Mercado was holding 4 billion of USDC, which were yielding exactly 0%. And what was one of the more riskier assets we could have invested in? USDC, because it depicted uh, earlier this year. And there was a lot of uh, stress in the market. Uh, so securitization allows us a new opportunities to invest in private capital markets, while still having some uh, safety, because there is always a buffer of junior capital to avoid any fluctuation. So even if you don't have the price day by day, because private credit is more difficult to evaluate, we still have a cushion that makes sure that uh, we are safe and are generating some revenues. Because yeah, the, at the time, Maker Order was uh, losing revenues, well, there was almost no revenues. So obviously, you cannot sustain a protocol that is that big if you are losing money every year. So now Maker Order is, uh, is quite uh, profitable, so there is no, no more this issue, thanks to securitization. Got it. And Kirill, I'll come back to you in a second, but. Kevin, I just want to fast forward. So when Block Tower made the decision to launch a credit fund and you started looking at the on-chain securitization effort versus maybe what it was going to do, what it would take to just do something off-chain, talk us through the discrepancies, the differences, the compare and contrast, the pros, cons. What were some of the things that really stood out? I'm sure there were some benefits, yeah. but <laughs> I'm sure there were some tough decisions that had to be made oh, along yeah. the way for you all. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's been quite a journey for sure. Um, when we initially evaluated um, and just rifting off of what uh, Seb had uh, described in terms of the maker system, we started to draw comparisons and parallels to what we see in TradFi, right? The ability to tranche uh, an underlying basket of assets and be able to uh, take on uh, you know, financing or leverage on that is a well understood concept, but not without any difficulties in terms of bridging the gap between the traditional finance landscape and how smart contracts in the on chain world work. So that was really an iterative process of being able to understand what tools, for example, does the centrifuge protocol provide to enable some of the key structural aspects that uh, traditional securitization should or must have. Uh, while also understanding that we're kind of in the early stages of the technology. So accepting some of the compromises, ideally structuring it, kind of falling back to the traditional legal uh, system and structure to accommodate for those early compromises, understanding that we're continually building a platform of you know, on-chain securitization so that you can embed and incorporate what we traditionally would see as structural elements in uh, traditional securitizations in, into on-chain securitization. So um, it's, I would just say it's a continually evolving conversation in that, in that regard and recognizing that 
uh, the traditional finance industry has gone through several iterations of optimizations on uh, the underlying legal structures and uh, you know servicing structures and custodial structures that uh, benefit uh, kind of modern finance traditional securitization today and um, bringing those optimizations to uh, the similar structures that we're aiming to create uh, you know via uh, platforms like centrifuge with partners like maker um, I think that's important to recognize got some more thoughts but I'll come back to them in a second uh, Carell I just want to hear from you quickly you were the first one to mint a real world asset with MakerDAO. You then got a $20 million debt ceiling, I think in 2021, right? With MakerDAO that you utilized. Is that right? Started out with five yeah. to 20. Five to 20. And then you most recently, a proposal was passed by the MakerDAO community to grant you a $50 million debt ceiling, right? Correct. How is your securitization process, right? Or how you do your, how you run your business and how you think about using, accessing Maker's Capital, using the centrifuge protocol, um, what what about what you're doing in on-chain securitizations has changed the most in those three years? Um, I mean, we try to run our business as an institution would uh, to the best that we can with, you know, uh, perhaps a smaller size and and being more nimble as with the technology and, and, and obviously the, uh, the on-chain component. Um, but, you know, I think we, we, we you know, we're... We're risk averse ourselves. We, you know, we do a lot of underwriting. We have separation within the company, um, and um, you know, the on-chain. I think, you know, it, it, it's it, it's definitely a component that um, I think has brought value, and it, I see it, it could bring a lot more value in the future as well. All right, so let's get specific. So if we go back to earlier today, I think. What Thomas say, 25 to 30 percent of the securitization process is on chain, and then Chris at Galaxy, I think, said less than two percent. Um, Seb, coming back to you, right? There's for me, there's this dichotomy between the soft benefits of using um, the blockchain for an on chain securitization um, versus kind of like the hard technical pieces, right? Like the smart contracts pieces, like that. Um, I think there's, uh, well, I'll, I'll save my opinions. Just help us understand this, right? Just tangibly today, on-chain securitizations, where is the technology making a difference? Um, and then maybe on even at like an ecosystem level, right? Whether it be legal or service providers, um, is it cheaper to access certain services on-chain than it would be off-chain from a securitization process? But it would be great. Just give us through your lens. Um, how How should we think about where there's value being created, whether that be hard technical or kind of like a softer services type offering on chain. Yeah, sure. So again, it's a process. If you, at the beginning, why would an institution raise capital in DeFi? Because it's super complicated. They have uh, those entities that don't really exist, DAOs. You have to have, uh, to spend a lot of uh, legal fees to be sure that everything is uh, proper and so on. And we didn't we didn't remove a lot of the cost of traditional uh, securitization. So you can say, well, it's just traditional securitization, but more difficult. But we kind of see the benefit, the early days of benefits. Uh, for instance, a centrifuge there is a smart contract that does a calculation agent. So you don't need to know who gets what and pay someone a lot of fees to run an Excel spreadsheet to know what they should send to everyone, anyone. It's on the smart contract, and you can be sure that the answer will be real time and always the good one, uh, if you didn't make any issue at the beginning. Uh, so that's one uh, cost saving. It's really removing all the, the intermediaries. Uh, another one is transfer agents. I know that some uh, big institutions are going to DeFi and can provide lower cost money market funds because they say, well, I don't pay my transfer agent that much because he's not doing his spreadsheet in all orders, and it's just on chain. So you can remove this one. Uh, there are still a lot of components. If you look at, you can actually you can look on the form because everything is transparent. If you look at how MakerDAO is investing billions in T bills, you can see all those people all around. I mean, the whole idea is that at some point, uh, sorry, Kevin, there will be no one left, only smart contract, and we will both be out of job. Maybe not uh, Kirill because someone need to underwrite the underlying, but 
you can just replace everything with code. Currently, it's super complicated. We still have to go uh, off chain to have an exchange agent, which could be a Coinbase, a Galaxy Digital, well, plenty of other uh, providers. Then we need to send the fiat all around the globe, which amazingly doesn't work super well if you try to do it at scale. Uh, then to do, yeah, we have trustees, we have service providers. So it's a lot of stuff. And the idea is to automate all of that, to focus on what is the most highest value part of the job is really asset allocation, or what do I want to invest? And you can automate all those stuff. So really removing the people out of the equation to replace them with the code. Yeah. So follow on there, Kevin, but I, just to recap there, transfer agent, payment agent, verification agent. Calculation agent. What are we missing here, Kevin? Well, I would I would say that those are definitely the key broad categories sure. that we were ca we're capturing. Uh, but any step of the process of the securitization and operational process that uh, has to do with the execution of business logic, we found that the upfront work of setting up uh, the structure on chain, currently because of the tools that are disposable does take a little bit more time and a little bit more rigor in setting up uh, the smart contract flow and uh, all of the agents necessary to provide the inputs to ultimately execute on some business logic. But once you have that set up, you really are um, relying on uh, and working at a speed where the, uh, the execution of the business logic is purely you know, software. So having the calculation agent, you know, become more automated with a higher degree of settlement and um, kind of settlement assurances um, is in our minds like pulling the distance between a lender and borrower uh, closer uh, with more rigorous and confined parameters that are codified into you know, on-chain logic, computer logic that um, enables enables a lot of the cost efficiencies that Seb had mentioned. Um, but ultimately, I would also imagine a world where that enables new structures, new structures that weren't possible in, uh, uh, in a system where uh, you know, intermediaries and effectively uh, human actors need to make more discretionary-based judgment that can ultimately re result in errors, result in kind of disputes or conflicts. Um, putting that out front, putting that into smart contract logic has really a, unlocked in our minds um, a new realm of possibility for how we can think about structuring and all of it comes, boils down to like the structuring element of uh, a securitization you know, uh, or a security. So yeah, I would just. So that's good. I've got one here because Leshner said what? The ingenuity of the DGENs is astounding. So um, Kirill, for you, right? The way you. The DGEN. <laughs> um, the way you do business, right, has anything about the way you think about doing securitizations changed in the context of how the technology has developed over the last three years, right? And I guess the, the context being here, right, that I think um, those in crypto, the technologists, the builders, always trying to rethink um, how this could be done. Right and how it could look like and how it could work versus you know the traditional financial groups right have something that's worked it's tried and true and they've done it for a hundred years um, you know if it ain't for, if it ain't broke don't fix it so tell us a little bit just about maybe how how you see it right and if if in it, if at all right how you do how you do your business change because of the impact of this technology over the last three years yeah I mean I, I think I think three years is maybe a, a short time frame to to think about it and and um, I, I think that, you know, as far as just like features and making things easier, I mean, obviously, you know, using Centrifuge's product and going on the, the new Centrifuge um, chain is going to improve like sort of the features and the usability of the product. Uh, but as far as like our business, I kind of just think about like, first of all, that I think, you know, real estate and RWA in general is ideal for, for blockchain tokenization. Um, and, and I was actually just recently looking at a securitization prospectus from like the 1980s or so, like just when that whole securitization started, uh, you know, traditional securitizations, and it was maybe like 20 or 30 pages. And then I picked one up from, you know, a current one, and it's like 300 pages, right? Like, I mean, not, I don't know, who in the right mind can can go through that prospectus, but you know, 
for a lot of money, people do, I guess. Um, it's really simple. I mean, you, you just take that business logic and, and everything that goes with it and you code it into a smart contract and you don't need to you know have people reviewing the prospectus all the time, right? The smart contract will do its job or do 80% of, of that job for you and you're certain that execution will be won't be left up to a human judgment every time, right? So I, I think that's that's like the the north star for me for for the things that are happening right now. So Kevin, coming back to you um, on the block tower credit side, right? You're probably looking at things that have worked. There's probably a couple of things that don't work. Um, let's talk a little bit about what doesn't work, right? If we're going to be faster, cheaper, better. Um, there's probably some adjustments that need to be made along the way. What, what is, what's the wish list look like for you at Block Tower? And I guess more broadly for more securitizations to take place across more protocols, you know, private versus public, DeFi versus not, whatever. Um, what, what, what are the adjustments that we need to see um, technically or within just the broader crypto ecosystem to get there? Yeah, I don't, you're going to get me started. And I think it's going to be a dangerous path. Um, I'll, I'll focus on one particular category of uh, the securitization lifecycle or process that uh, is needs to be a focus in the next kind of iteration of how we uh, innovate on these platforms, and particularly that's the servicing end. Because uh, as Seben mentioned, at the end of the day, many of the assets that we are interacting with, touching, and feeling or using within um, the constructs that we hope to securitize are in fact in the real world that require uh, entities, servicing bodies, and trustees to affect changes to them or, or uh, conduct updates to them within the real world. And basically, um, if we were to effectively bridge over these assets and enable them to be traded, to be um, uh, offered on these on-chain platforms, you need a similar degree of um, uh, capabilities from a servicing perspective, to enact uh, some key protections that investors and buyers, on the on the other hand, demand um, from uh, you know a security that they're they're investing into. So, what's what's one of those demands? Just give us a very tangible example for a second. Yeah, I would say one one key demand is um, should the should the asset go into an event of default, having an actor on the other side enforce the recourse or the protections necessary to recoup as much of the asset value uh, back to the end borrower uh, or lender as possible. Um, these you know servicing agents within traditional securities perform these um, perform these real world actions that are much needed that ultimately guarantee some. Um, kind of principal protection and preservation for the lender, which is ultimately the goal. Um, and without that, it's very difficult for a buyer on the other side to participate in these on-chain ecosystems without that full uh, recourse ability or full ability to service the end asset. So I think I think that's one area that uh, you know we would highlight, and we're working with you know partners. I see in current the like the the uh, audience who are starting to think through how servicing or how these uh, you know, real world entities and uh, actors can interact with on-chain securitization platforms. Great point. Seb, coming back to you, right? Steakhouse Financial, obviously, you guys were kind of born out of MakerDAO, and, but you have other clients, right? You do other work. Um, help us understand just thinking about other protocols that you work with, right? Other pockets of capital. How are they thinking about either what they've seen through MakerDAO over the last three three years or even the conversation that you have to, the education work that you have to do from around on-chain securitizations and how does this work, how far away are we, right, with on-chain capital for them really understanding at a, at a deeper visceral level what they're actually getting themselves into when they think about accessing or investing into an on-chain securitization? Yeah, sure. I would say there are two points. Uh, one, first, when you are a DeFi uh, community, it's difficult to go on the real world because a lot of uh, those communities and the whole idea of crypto or DeFi was born to say, well, no, try, try, they don't do anything good. Let's recreate everything on chain. Let's remove all the people. Let's remove all the real stuff. Obviously, you don't go that far because I never ate any ETH or Bitcoin, but it would not be very healthy. So we still need to, to go and uh, 
provide some financial services to the real world. And so there is some time to be spent on explaining that, well, that's great, you are making a lot of money on crypto, and you can loan against a crypto collateral like a Bitcoin or ETH, and that's quite safe, it's kind of a repo because the price can fluctuate, but you have a big buffer. But you are lending to people that already had a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies. So you are not helping the world. You are just giving more money or facility of financing for wealthy people. I'm not sure that was the goal of uh, crypto. So you need to do the messy part of going uh, on the more risky side and lending to SMEs, lending to people all over the world so they can uh, create more economic value for the whole uh, uh, system. So that's quite tricky. And that's why we need to, to move forward. That's why I'm always saying, well, private credit is important. Uh, we could do, we could lend to just uh, the, I don't know, the big corporates that are uh, rated by Moody's investment grade. But I mean, they already have a lot of capital. So we really want to have an impact on the world. And so the idea is really to tell those communities, you have a pool of capital. We work mainly for a, a lot for stable coins. And stable coins are really interesting because if you do the analogy, it's not one on one because the regulatory framework is completely different. And, uh, but stable coins have, in some way, some banking services. In a way, they are issuing stable coin, which gives them capital that they can invest longer term to create more economic value for everyone. But you need to be very careful on the asset liability management. You don't want to uh, lend too much to one borrower or one part of the world. You want to be diversified. You want to manage your liquidity profile so your uh, stablecoin holders can redeem. Usually, there is no need for giving the redemption capability, but it's way better for stablecoin to have uh, redemptions that ensure that it stays as one. So really two parts. One, understanding what you are trying to achieve make the world a better place. And two, then you need to understand asset liability management, which sounds like boring, but it's quite uh, amazingly interesting. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.